And today I am joined uh, by Martin Braddock. Uh, Martin is an associate for the CICD. He's also an experienced executive and leadership coach and change management mm -hmm. consultant who works with primarily with senior executives and their teams um, to help them achieve performance, which is for today's topic. Um, prior to that, he's had many experiences in business and a 30 year career history operating at a senior level uh, within HR for international blue chip organizations. Hi, Martin. Hello, Charlotte. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. So, the coronavirus crisis has probably the biggest challenge that has been brought on two organizations has been the, adapt the adaptation to remote working. Um, a recent survey that we did showed that prior to the outbreak, only 15% of organizations in the region had any work from home arrangements whatsoever. And for those who did, it concerned less than one in 10 employees. And of course, as we all moved into a lockdown, the majority of the country that you're working in, 60% of companies reported that all of their employees worked from home in the past um, couple months. So it's been a, a great, great shift. Um, I know that some of you are now returning to the office. Uh, for us at the CFD in the Middle East, um, we are currently being told that we will be working from home until the end of the year. So with every change comes a set of challenges. And for the majority of you, as I've been talking through a series of webinars um, since April, tracking and making performance uh, and the performance of employees who are working remotely was one of your top three challenges. Uh, and we've also noticed that nearly half of the employers in the region are, were somewhat very concerned about their employees' productivity. So this is what brought us to today's session, and this is what we will be talking about today. Hopefully, we'll give you some practical insights um, and ideas into how you can help your line managers um, uh, drive and manage performance. Um, so, Martin, um, before we get started, actually, we wanted to know um, what your roles are, everyone joining us today. So, you're going to see if I manage to put this live. Yes. All right. You're going to see a poll open now in the chat box. Could you let us know if you are um, in HR or L&D, if you're a line manager, an external coach, a consultant, or a business owner, so we know who we're talking to today and how we can best help you. So we see great majority are HR and energy professionals with us today. Okay, I can't see the results of the, the poll, Charlotte. So have we got any um, line managers with us today? So we've got a very few line managers, uh, so about 10% of line managers and uh, 50, some, some 50, 60 percent of HR and L&D professionals with us today in the room. Okay, great. Has anybody put their job role into the other category? Have we got any of the others? Uh, we have some others. So those who've answered okay. others, what are you responsible for? What do you do? Yeah, if you're happy to share that with us, that would be great, because obviously um, it helps me align the, uh, the presentation, the answers to the questions to make sure I'll try and cover all of the different categories. So if you can share that with us, that would be great. If you'd rather not, that's equally no problem at all. Good. Talent acquisition. So, yeah, HR. Okay. Lecturer from management courses. All um, right, okay. All right, so um, we're going to get started, and as soon as I figure out how to start sharing that slide, you will be able to see us on the big screen in the meantime. So, um, Martin, when you and I spoke about performance management, the first thing that you told me is that this ties into leadership, and, um, and that there are some leadership qualities that are needed to be embedded, whether you're a line manager in HR or in l and in, in order to be able to effectively drive and manage performance. So, what exactly? is a link um, and what are some of the skills that are a prerequisite in order to be able to do that? Okay, right. Thanks. Great question, Charlotte. I just I will answer that question. I just want to preface it, if I may, by saying obviously the title of the webinar is Leading Remote Teams. So not unsurprisingly, um, because of my background experience of what I do for my living, which is working with a lot of leaders as a 
as a coach. I'm going to focus on that leading part of the, the question. So that may not be a surprise to any of you who are, who are on the uh, webinar. Um, what I am maybe slightly surprising is I'm going to challenge the heading itself and say, actually, what's the difference between being remote and non-remote? And although, as Charles has said, we've, you know, we live in the age of COVID-19, some of the things I want to share with you today is around leadership qualities that are, I believe, and every, you know, I'm open to challenge and questions, please send them in, is uh, a set of qualities and behaviors and attributes that are transferable, whether we are working remotely or non-remotely, whatever non-remotely means, which can mean face-to-face. -face. Um, and I've been fortunate to work for about 10 years in the Middle East, and most of my clients at senior level have actually been managing remotely anyway, pre-COVID-19, because the organizational structure, and I think a number of you on the call will recognize this, means that um, they're managing or leading people in different parts of the world, even if it might be within the Middle East, North Africa, or EMEA, EMEA region, as we often call it. Um, so, having said that, the preface, I think some of the qualities, key qualities, are around, um, firstly and foremost, I think the leader has a responsibility to develop some clear role definitions and expectations from his or her uh, colleagues. Um, and I think those goals and expectations need to be aligned with a purpose. So my learning from the people I've worked with in terms of how they manage performance remotely is the starting point is very much about having a clarity of purpose. What are we here for? And that question can be applied to an individual, his or her specific job responsibilities. It can be certainly applied to the leader. What's his or her role in the scheme of things? And it can be applied to a department, a division, and ultimately organization. So the sense of purpose, sense of direction is very important. Obviously, well, often in many cases, large organizations have very clear statements around mission statements and vision statements, which are fine and fantastic, but the clarity of purpose, i.e. why are we here and what we are seeking to achieve collectively and individually, I think is quality number one that a leader has to be able to articulate and communicate to, to their team. Um, okay, I don't know if there's any, if you want to ask me anything else at that point, whether you want to carry on, Charlotte, because there's other, other qualities which I think are around uh, having said that, and it's about how they operate. And this is very much around how they behave. So if we look at, um, there's, there was a piece of research done many years ago about um, performance management being process focused by it being uh, rather than people focused being a formal process annual performance appraisals for example which we can come back to because I challenge their effectiveness in terms of uh, how they improve or affect performance management positively um, and those things can have a very the research showed they have a very low level of impact on performance one of the things that a leader needs to do is get people engaged. So employee engagement, for those of you who work in HR, will probably know how challenging that can be to get employees engaged with the organization, engaged with the, the purpose. Um, and then I think the third thing is around how the leader operates, how he behaves. So I think he should be clear on the cause or purpose. Uh, he or she should be uh, collaborative, so actually care about their team, their team members team, care about themselves as well, which is just as important. Um, and they should be able to connect the overall purpose with the specific issues they're working with with those individual team members. Um, and I think they should be not necessarily comfortable, but aware of the fact that, that we are managing and leading in times of complexity. COVID-19 has added to that complexity, added to the chaos. You probably heard of the phrase VUCA world which is actually becoming a little bit dated now in terms of reality where we, where we are. But having that ability to recognize complexity and, and, and um, align themselves in that way. And last but not least, I think a key behavior a leader should demonstrate is courage. And what do I mean by that? I mean courage and being able to, I use the phrase, take a brave pill and delegate, empower their colleagues to deliver and make them accountable for that delivery. So I think those are the five things that um, 
come to my mind, um, Charlotte, and things I've learned from the leaders I've worked with in terms of good practice. Fantastic. Thank you. So you're doing me a great segue to sort of the next thing that we'll be talking about. So you're saying we need a balance between um, delivering a clear vision that engages and inspires, but also focusing on outputs, which we are going to uh, get into in a little bit. Um, but first, you're talking, I mean, the, the, the base of everything that you're talking about right now relates to trust, which is something mm-hmm. you're talking about delegating, empowering. And so we know that trust is key. Um, we know well that in the Middle East, traditionally, we've had we, many companies are still focusing on input rather than output, i.e. the culture of presentism for many. So trust is very easy to say, um, but it's much, much harder to do there needs to be a mindset shift. What can organizations do and why is trust so important, um, Martin? Um, again, very good question. Trust is, I call it, the foundation of, um, of everything in terms of how an organization can operate. And certainly in terms of how a leader can operate with their team to deliver results. Um, some of you call might be familiar with Patrick Lencioni's work where he talked about the five dysfunctions of a team, um, the foundation of the triangle, um, which we haven't got on a slide, but the foundation of the triangle is trust. So um, I'm just checking you're still there, Charlotte. I've got some messages saying low bandwidth. Are you still there? I'm still there, Mark. I think you're, you're okay, blurred. Okay. okay, I can't see you, but I can hear you. Um, so the basis of trust is so important. Um, because without that trust being established, you can't progress to the next stages of a, of a high-performing team or a high-performing organization. Uh, where you move on from trust into an area where you're comfortable to have conflict. And conflict doesn't mean having uh, physical conversations where people are entrusted to be able to share their views, thoughts, opinions, and ideas. So this is part of a collaborative process. And then you move on to commitments and the commitment to achievement of goals and hopefully moving on from that to accountability and results. Um, So trust is the foundation, I believe. Um, And the old adage is sometimes it can take a long time to build trust and trust can be destroyed in a moment. Um, And I think that adage stands well. So when we're talking about leaders and leading performance management, I think we have to recognize that sometimes that's about empowering the leaders to achieve and obtain the trust from their colleagues. And that is often by actions, not just words. So people who are assessing other people, we all do it in our day-to-day working lives, we assess people by their actions, often by how they see, say things as well. But certainly from a leadership perspective, and gaining trust, that is going to be gained by actions. And what I mean by actions are the things that I touched on before, which is being able to empower, delegate their colleagues and give them the responsibility to take on board challenges and tasks that maybe the leader feels uncomfortable doing. And I've had quite a few examples of clients I work with where they have a real problem letting go and have a real problem giving that empowerment to their colleagues because they feel they won't do as good a job as they could do, fundamentally, mm-hmm. many the case. That's a, that's, a, that's a really, really good point, Martin. So um, we know that because of the uncertainty that we found ourselves in, many organizations have had to shorten the time frames of goal setting, right? So we're no longer looking at in six months' time, but perhaps meeting more often, uh, shortening those time frames and having shorter-term goals and objectives. Um, you've just said it, temptation is to micromanage when we can't be together and see that other people are working. So what would be your advice for HR and line managers? How do we resist the temptation, this temptation to micromanage, to get too hands-on? Um, and when is it okay to actually get back hands-on? Is it ever okay to, to get back into this more micromanagement style? Yeah, it's an, I think it's an interesting paradox here because if we look at the current situation and we talk about how leaders or managers engage with their colleagues or people who work for them, but I'm going to use the phrase colleagues and we know what that means. 
then obviously the advice is, and the experience I've had with my clients is that the regular communication under the current situation and circumstances is generally a good thing. And some research was conducted in 2018 by um, Reflective Group found that 94% of employees would prefer their manager to give feedback and engage with them on a regular basis, i.e. at least on a quarterly basis and preferably more frequently than that. So the paradox or potential paradox is the feeling that people are being um, micromanaged. Well, it's not about being micromanaged, it's about having regular communication so that they feel comfortable that they're getting the support and empowerment from their boss when they're asked to do things. And it's, a, it's an interesting balance because that balance is you don't want to feel people are being micromanaged, but they want to feel they're getting the right level of support and commitment and encouragement and challenge because that's part of the boss's role in what they're doing on a day-to-day -day regular basis. So in summary, regular communication is something I've learned which is coming through in COVID-19 times. Keep that connection between boss and colleagues is so important. But in that process, then enable your colleagues through empowerment to take away responsibilities and then take away accountability for delivery. And that's different from micromanagement, which is a methodology which is just checking up on people. Have you done this? Have you done that? Do this, do that. That's not, that's not um, a collaborative and encouraging style. That's a command and control style, which I know still exists in some organizations, but it is really, it's very old hat and yesterday. So that's what I mean by um, the balance between support and uh, encouragement and challenge. And that comes back to the leader's skill sets and attitude of mind and approach and behaviors that he and she can build that trust through that process in, in regular communication with their, uh, with their colleagues. I don't know if that's a little bit, hopefully. I think we're going to spend a little bit more time on trust as I see questions coming through on that. Mm. Um, so Chris here is saying micromanagement doesn't give room to build trust. Of course, mm. um, I think it should be the other way around, trust and then management and goal setting. How can we build trust uh, remotely? Um, and then we've had we've had a few questions around empowering leaders. Um, so where the trust wasn't necessarily a prominent part of a company's culture. Um, it now has had to become because of the way in which we're having to work. Where would you start to lay the foundation for trust? Um, and can this be done in such a short amount of time? We, we hear the saying as much as the saying trust can be broken uh, in, in a, overnight. Uh, we also used to say trust takes time to be built. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think you, can, you can start at the top um, by giving some clear messages through the uh, statements that an organization provides top down that it can say what type of organization it is, that it's an organization which is encouraging its employees to contribute, et cetera, et cetera. We, you know, we're all familiar with those sort of phrases and statements, which is great, and I think they're relevant. Then it comes back to the point I made before, which is about taking action. So actions speak louder than words. And let, me, let me give you, and Chris, great point, 100% agree with the your comment there. Let me give you a real life example. I was working with somebody um, in uh, Kuala Lumpur for an international global IT business. Um, and the, the, the lady concerned, amazing uh, range of talents, capabilities, skills, a lovely person, great personality. She had a real challenge letting go. Um, and she was working for an American group, so international IT American group. So you can narrow it down from there, but I won't say who the client was. We have lots of discussions about how can you empower people? How can I entrust people? And how can I tr entrust them to deliver on my behalf? And we took one specific example. And her, her boss, who's based in the States, was aware of this restriction, this uh, um, yeah, restriction on her ability to develop and grow as a leader. So we talked to, talked to a specific example, and I said, right, you have a challenge there, you have a task, um, delegate it to your colleague and give her as much guidance as you can, but let go. She felt incredibly uncomfortable to let go, but she entrusted her colleague. Her colleague's response was, 
oh, you're entrusting me to do this, are you? Wow, that's the first, because you've always been micromanaging me. Now I'm being allowed to do it. There was a corollary, and I advised, because it wasn't coaching, I advised my client, I said, what will happen is it probably won't go as well as you think it will. It probably won't go as well as you think you could have done it. Just be aware that that's what may happen. And that's exactly what did happen. But she got feedback from her boss. She got feedback from her subordinate, which is an old-fashioned word, but a person who reported to her and said, thank you very much for doing that. And then they reviewed what went well and what could go better next time. So she'd empowered. <clears throat> she'd taken the brave pill, as I call it. She got a decent result in terms of the task. The task wasn't beautifully done to the standard she would have liked it. But she went through a learning process, so did her colleague who she delegated to, and so did her boss. And they'd learned from it. Subsequently, she delegated another challenge a few weeks later, which went really well. And some of the, um, the uh, consequences of, of working that way are that you, you buy trust. You get trust from your colleague to you, to you as a leader and vice versa. So that foundation gets built and then you can allow to build on that foundation and enable people to be empowered. And consequently, she was in a position then to focus more on strategic issues, which is a very regular issue that comes up with for me leaders. How can I let go? How can I empower? How can I delegate? Because I'm asked to be more strategic. I'm too busy doing all these things because they can't do it as well as I can. So those, you know, there's some, I've got other examples, but very practical examples saying that's how you can build trust as a leader by giving that action, but also as an employee for your boss, taking that on board and delivering, being accountable. Empowerment is great, but the person who's being empowered then becomes accountable for delivery, which is fair, I think. Yeah, I think you're you're making some some great some great points here on well one the challenge of letting go which we've all seen from line managers either because they're worried that the job won't be done or that it won't be done as well as if they had done it, um, but also with empowerment comes accountability and I think that's really important. We go back to kind of the the, the goal setting which we're going to go to in a second. One question that we have from Michael. Um, encouraging versus coming and control style was I the former, so the encouraging side. Is there any evidence that the encouraging side is more effective with regards to productive output? So I guess before I leave it over to, to you, Martin. Um, uh, okay, great question. Um, I'll answer it in two ways. There's anecdotal, which is through my own direct experience working with leaders across the Middle East and, and outside the Middle East where I've seen evidence of uh, results and improvement. So, you know, the example I gave, I've got other examples I could give, but I won't do because of the time allowed. So I've seen anecdotal evidence. <clears throat> but I was thinking somebody might ask me this question. So I did a little bit of research. It was a great question. And, and some of the research that was carried out by um, this organization called Reflective. I'm looking at my notes ahead of me. Uh, they did a, a study called Growth Divide Study. So if anybody wants to make a note of that now, it's worth having a look at. It was 2018, so fairly uh, recent. <clears throat> what they found that companies uh, where the employees um, were met to review goals on a quarterly or more frequent basis uh, are 50% more likely to have above average financial performance. So a piece of research, I'm sure that can be challenged. Um, but it's interesting, that's what the research found. And I say in addition to that, um, I've got anecdotal uh, evidence which says that behavior, that collaborative behavior is, um, is far more effective than command and control. I mean, um, sadly or positively, as you said, Charlotte, I've got about 30 years of corporate experience as well before I became a coach. And, you know, I evidence a lot of command and control behaviors over the years and also evidence the alternative approach and if any of you do read or study about leadership behaviors if you look to the book about 20 years ago the emphasis will be on power delivery and action read read leadership books now there's a lot more a lot more evidence on humility collaboration engagement and therefore empowerment um, and i have had many discussions with people who have challenged that but push back very strongly as you'd expect and say, well, actually, having humility 
being be prepared to challenge, taking on board your your colleagues' challenges and commitments makes you a much stronger leader because it demonstrates you're comfortable to be challenged from all angles and also be supportive. And sometimes to say, actually, that's a good idea. Let's go with that. It's a better idea than I could have come up with. So um, hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, and I think that's a, there's a great point in what you're saying as well, um, HBR. I, I shared a couple of resources in the chat for participants. Um, HBR and other resources and articles point to the fact that empowering teams and engaging teams works very well when done for um, less routine tasks. When you're looking, when you're exactly what you just said, Martin. When you're looking to get innovative ideas, when you want them to be able to come up with their ideas with a constructive criticism or to challenge certain things that are not working, um, less so when it is about routine tasks. So the more um, clinical jobs, extra, where perhaps it's very measurable, it's very it's <coughs> similar. Um, again, I'm sure there are some debatable points uh, in, in, in all of those, but interesting to note that um, we are going back to employee engagement. We're going back to culture. When, peop when, uh, when people are engaged, when they're engaged in the purpose, when they're engaged in the vision, um, they feel more inclined to do additional work for the company. They want to stay. They want to work for a company that appreciates them. Um, so I think it's also just a bigger picture than just the productivity. Um, if can, I, I, can I can I just add, sorry sorry to interrupt. Yeah. You triggered something in my mind. Another real example, which I think is you know, it's a very good point to say. Sometimes some jobs have very clear routines and need to be followed. And often those you know people use health and safety as an example. That you know you have to do certain things. I'm an ex that's why I started my career as a safety officer. So it's not many people know. So now everybody knows that. Um, and I had a, I was working with a, a client in the Middle East. And they had um, had an issue with dangerous chemicals, and the head of health and safety had a, a member of their staff who was responsible for locking up the compound with dangerous chemicals. And he said to me, I, "As much as I tell my member of staff to lock this compound up, because if a child breaks in, it could be fatal. If an adult breaks in, it could be near fatal because of the chemicals involved." He said he can't do it. He keeps forgetting. So I said, okay, well, let, perhaps you need to explain to him what the consequences are of him not locking the gate. I explained what the consequences are. <clears throat> the guy tied a ribbon around his wrist, and the ribbon around his wrist reminded him that every time he finished his shift, lock up the compound. So he never failed to forget them again, because he's then aware of the consequences of him not being accountable for his actions. So um, thanks for that, because that came back to me as a, Routine task, which should be done, but even in an example like that, sometimes that leadership needs a different approach. Say, think about the consequences. I'm empowering you. You're accountable. Deliver in that in, in a simple way. So that's a, for me. You brought that to the front of my mind. Yeah, yeah. And so um, great points again. I'm asking everybody to their how, and we'll keep taking questions as they come, and we'll go back if we've missed out on on a few by the end of the session. Um, so we're talking about accountability, we're driving accountability through empowerment. I think you made a really good point now, which I'd love to hear more about. Um, you're talking about making people aware of the consequences, which is often one of the ways to drive accountability. Um, what other, perhaps more tactical things can leaders do to drive that accountability um, and, and effectively delegate and empower when they are not able to, to see the work while still being able to manage and track the performance? Mm. Uh, yeah, great question. I think it's about ownership. And, and, and you know, empowering and um, delegating are, are, I think, important skills for leaders to have. But then it's around the example, as I just gave, is being accountable for delivery. You know, what are the consequences of... Um, not delivering, and the consequences could be, you know, a poor reflection on the individual. It's a lack of team contribution, possibly, a lack of delivery against the key project, the company not achieving its profit targets. I mean, you can you can work this back from an individual all the way up to organisational level. So I think you think about the consequences of non-delivery, but that's a negative element. That's a negative aspect. Sometimes that's important, 
sometimes when there's poor performance, as the example I gave, technically it was poor performance, how could you improve it? By explaining the consequences. On the more positive front, it's about saying, right, okay, we are working on these goals, we are working on these objectives, you've been involved and included, and my collaborative side has brought you into the discussion on those, and then how, you know, how are you going to be rewarded? So, you know, if I do a great job, boss, what am I going to get for that? Well, I'm going to get paid a salary and everything else, I'm going to keep my job, which is a sort of simplistic and brutal approach. But actually, think about how you reward people and recognize people for doing great jobs is incredibly powerful. Um, there have been many studies carried out about how recognition is much more of a positive element of employee engagement than financial reward. And that's been proven in many different instances over many different years. So developing a performance-related uh, program which incentivizes accomplishment. It might be recognition, it might be financial, or it might be a combination. So thinking through, I think a leader's got responsibility to say, well, if I'm going to empower people and get them to deliver and hold them accountable, and they do it, what's the recognition they're going to get? Where's the reward? And that is where I think um, good leaders make a difference by saying, I'm going, to, I'm going to deliver, I'm going to empower, hold people accountable, but they do a great job. I'm going to make sure they know it. And it might be a good idea to let other people know it as well. It depends on the circumstances. But that can, be, that can become then quite infectious in a positive way. Pardon the pun with COVID-19 and infections, but uh, we're talking about a positive infection there. <laughs> Yeah, and that's a good point there. It's something that, um, so we've recently had a webinar with John McDonough, who's our expert on conversation and reward, and one of the effects that he constantly speaks about, uh, and even more so highlighted during the conversation crisis, is non-financial recognition. And so the importance of being able to really, really support people in achieving their goals. And I know you were talking about uh, celebrating the small wins. Um, I mean, that can go, I would love to hear from you, the people on the line, what are some ways in which you recognize the small wins? Um, I know within organization and the, and the clients that we work with, it goes anywhere from a shout out or a high five on an intranet to um, giving somebody more responsibility, the opportunity to showcase their work um, to the rest of the team, um, even a personal thank you from the leader. Um, and, and of course, then you have more um, uh, token, perhaps vouchers, extra, that can, that can be a nice thing to have, especially at a time of crisis, and then um, what John refers to low-cost, high-impact items uh, in the final in reward uh, scheme. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I'm, I've not met John, but I, you know, I agree with him 100%. Again, going back to my you know, real example clients in, the, uh, in Southeast Asia, and what she did was she, she then um, held an event for recognition. Um, of people who had achieved certain things. So, you know, they had a project together, their accountabilities were identified, delivery was made, and then there was an event which was held. And because an American parent, one of the senior guys from the States came over, and, and it wasn't high cost. It wasn't high cost at all, but the recognition was so important. And, and of course, that um, encourages loyalty and commitment from, from your employee base because they, you know, they feel they've been recognized and rewarded for what they've contributed. Um, so yeah, I think you know, it doesn't have to be expensive, flashy ways of doing things at all. It's just that basic level of recognition and making sure that um, if you're in a big organization that the senior guys are getting involved as well and they, and they contribute towards that recognition, even if it's a one-liner or if it's coming on a video screen, which is very easy to do and say, you know, thank you very much for the work you've done, guys. And when I say guys, by the way, I mean ladies and men. So just in case anybody's about to attack me on that, when I use the phrase guys, both sexes. That's fine. Um, so um, there is something that I wanted to ask you about. We've talked about recognition. We've talked about recognition. We've talked about delegation and empowerment. And so I wanted to dig a little bit more within goal setting. Um, so we we're saying we want people to achieve goals. Now we know from recent safety research and uh, a whole lot more that it causes that less than 50% of line managers have received any formal management training whatsoever, which of course means that you have some that are naturally better at it than others. Um, but in general, things like goal setting or performance management or encouragement are not things they have been trained for. Um, in the context of now, 
where um, for sure business objectives overall will be reworked and perhaps even company budgets will be reworked on shorter chunks of time. Um, that means objectives will have to be probably uh, revised regularly. Mm. What some ways in which leaders can um, can set smart objectives uh, and goals? Okay. Yeah, great question. Well, I think you know, I mean, you partially answered it anyway. Thank you by saying smart objectives. And um, you know, the, the fact we are uh, one of the points that I, I haven't mentioned is I think developing managers in having coaching skills, which is, I'm bound to say, but I do believe that is, is an important thing. So if we are talking about leadership and being able to um, set goals with people, whether remotely or whether it's non-remotely. That's an important process that a leader has to take leadership in and that he or she needs to be able to understand how to uh, set goals with colleagues and for them to contribute. So, you know, the classic style is um, everybody has a performance review every year, which is just doesn't enhance performance management generally, I don't think. Um, but you can you can goal set on, 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 the, on the go. So one of the key things about good performance management is it's an ongoing sustainable process. You know, we're not talking about saying, well, it's a performance appraisal time this year. So it's May the 1st or whatever it is. Oh, by the way, I've got to do a performance appraisal. Um, and I'm the boss and I can't remember what a great job Charlotte did in January 2019. But oh, I remember she didn't do such a good job in May 2020. So I'm just using as an example, Charlotte, and I apply it to myself. That's why those performance appraisal systems are one of the reasons they fail. If you have an ongoing sustainable process which says, okay, say you're my boss, Charlotte, I'd like to talk to you every month about how things are going. But at the beginning of the process, let's, co let's select the goals, let's select the objectives. Because we know what the purposes of our organization, we know what the team's going to deliver on, we've got clarity of the overall goals, how does that shake out and work for me as a you're my boss? So we have that discussion, agreed on those goals. There might be some negotiation, of course. But, you know, you're still the boss, so you, you agree on the goals and say, right, you know, you're now signed up to, committed to those goals. So it's involving people in goal setting rather than just saying those are your goals for the, for the six months. There's no commitment to it. Um, so the, the key element there to answer that question is helping leaders and managers understand that the goal setting process should encourage, so it should involve the people who are working for them and that they should set them, agree them, and then monitor them. And this is not micromanagement. It's monitoring on a regular basis and encouraging people and saying, how are you getting on? What else do you need? What support do you need? Why haven't you achieved this? So a um, very quick story. One of my best bosses as CEO as an HR director, I had six goals every year which were agreed because I was a division of HR. We had different businesses in different parts of the world, and that was it. We had, I had six goals, and then I was empowered. But I was fully account. I knew I was fully accountable for delivery. So I would have ongoing conversations with my boss about those six goals. At any one point in time, it wasn't say right. You know, every every month we sit down and talk about your performance. It's about this is ongoing, sustainable conversation. That's the key thing that is, I think, differentiates good performance management from bad performance management. It's not a one-off annual performance appraisal event. This ongoing, sustainable, strategic process which breaks down tactically to how you and I were engaging if we are in a boss relationship. Yeah, this is something that's been championed by organizations like Adobe, I think they're one of the first ones and many more who um, broke apart sort of the traditional annual uh, performance review process. Yeah. Uh, obviously, some of the, I think, ob objections to this was to say how well does the feed forward go? Do we still need to have those milestones throughout the year? Um, but again, in the context of today, having this ongoing conversation that so that are ongoing, collaborating and agreed on together to repeat what you just said is really important. Yeah. Um, I just uh, thought, unless you want to add something on this, I uh, just thought it'd be good to um, wrap this up and so for the next 15 minutes focus and ensure that we answer people's main concern by understanding what their main challenge of performance is if you're okay sure that? yeah absolutely yeah. i've probably rattled on long enough so it's time yeah to ask questions. you're right so i just 
picture of Pinterpol in the chat. Uh, we want to make sure that we're addressing your concerns uh, and, and don't leave you with unanswered questions. So what is your biggest challenge when it comes to performance management? Is it being virtual face to face, a negative perception of performance review, um, getting employees to commit, or um, employees and managers feel that uh, the performance management may lead to negative feedback, or finally, ensuring that people are actually working. If you could just, um, if you are with us, answer the poll. If you feel like the uh, options are really not in line with what your challenges, please tell us in the chat what your biggest challenges. That hopefully will give you with some uh, practical takeaways. So while we leave you a few more minutes to answer the poll, we've got a question from Reta. Um, who uh, is uh, uh, rebounding on what you just said, Martin, involving people in goal setting can be a critical task, especially when done remotely. How can we manage this collaborative process? Um, okay, yeah, thanks for the question. I think you can manage it by making sure it's, it is a recognized process, so you can put some time frames against that. I mean, this might be coming from an HR person, possibly, I don't know. Um, so from an HR perspective, if you want to make sure there's a, you know, these things are happening, you can put some time frames in, guidelines for managers, you know, how to do this, supportive um, uh, training or uh, education to ensure that they understand how they can do it, and then making sure that it's, uh, they're supported, because some people may feel or some people on a remote basis. I think if you provide a framework, I don't know, like using phrase do's and don'ts, but let's use it in terms of some guidance notes and a time frame against which um, you know you want people to do that. So there's a level of there's a level of process, but it's people focused and goal focused rather than just process focused. I, I don't think it needs to be any more complicated than what I just said. I can't hear you. Thanks. Um, we have another question from uh, Lewis today. Well, how to encourage people to switch cameras on so that we can see their facial expressions in one to one. So I'll tell you what we do um, within our teams. And <laughs> I don't know if you have any specific tips. That's a very specific question. Nonetheless, it is true that it's not the same thing to have conversations remotely than face to face. So what we are doing with the team now is to say, what you see a phone call can remain an audio call, what would have been a face-to-face -face meeting where we would have sat together uh, remains a come on uh, time. Um, it works really well with team meetings, so when the majority switches on their cameras, actually do to John, there is some form of peer pressure, peer pressure hopefully, and, and do it. But I agree, it's very important when having a pretty cool conversation to, to actually feel like you're, you're bonding and ensure that your tone of voice the right way. Hope that answers the question. Uh, now, one very quick practical example. I'm working with somebody at the moment who is very fearful of conducting one-to-one -one performance discussions with his team. He's come back to me and said, actually, it's been fantastic. I said, why is that? He said, because the, the camera never lies, and they, they can't, and we do insist on being on view. They can see me, I can see them. When we talk things through, there's an intensive focus so the focus is somehow intensified by being on camera. And there's a lot of work has been done recently about why are we all so exhausted after being on Zoom. You might all be exhausted after this webinar. I might be. Charlotte might be. It's because of this intensity of focus on the camera and sound at the same time. So it's recognizing that virtual is different. It's not the same. People who say it's the same, I don't think it is. But you know, there's some things that you can actually benefit from. And this is a client of mine who said, on camera, one-to-one, -one, I found that incredibly useful so we've got through the agenda and got through things in a way which has been more constructive than if we've been trying to arrange to meet in the office somewhere mm -hmm. so uh, there are two three more things that i wanted just to cover before we wrap up this webinar um the first one um well martin you're a coach it would be a shame to not draw on your coaching experience um so you've spoken a lot about encouraging people and supporting them remotely in achieving those goals um Coaching is a way to do that, and I know that as an independent coach, you've actually done a lot of remote coaching recently. 
Um, can or what would be your your tip for organisations in embedding that kind of support to to the people that they're trying to to motivate to perform, um, and ways in which you can do that? Okay, that's a that's a good question. That's a very big one. Um, but I think, uh, I think it's you know it, it, that's like on a, another webinar is how do you embed a coaching culture in an organisation? I think the short answer to your question is that's what you know. I'm obviously. Or maybe not so obviously, but that's a big believer in because I've seen results of the coaching cultures in organizations and the powerful results they, they, they bring. So I think that's the starting point is how can you do that? But then, as I say, that's like another 30 minutes, at least discussion around how you can do that. But fundamentally, it's doing that. And um, I think one of the benefits of having the effective performance management uh, processes that we've just been talking is, you, you know, you're developing leaders from within the organization. It's a development tool for them. So the key thing here is that, you know, you, number one is, number one, you're keeping employees engaged. Number two, you're developing leaders and managers because that's, you know, a key thing as well in terms of talent retention development. Uh, and I think, you know, those are, those are the main points. So it's engagement, development, and retention. They all link together. And with the challenges we have working remotely, Think about it in those terms and say, well, okay, now how can we make sure we are hitting those three targets through providing the right level of support, framework, and culture for our leaders to operate within? But that was uh, creating a coaching culture. So um, you've just touched upon, uh, you're, you're making my job a lot easier today. You just touched upon what happens when you have a good performance culture. What happens when you haven't got a performance coach? What are the signs that things are going wrong? Uh, the corollary of what I said, people get disengaged. I mean, there's been lots of research about employee engagement and how difficult it is and some really poor results in terms of employees not being engaged with their employers for lots of different reasons. So that's one, um, one um, uh, characteristic. Um, people's retention, talent development, retention, succession planning. So if you're losing key employees, um, that could be through lack of uh, good performance management. So you're losing talent or indeed not attracting talent. Um, you're not developing the right manager. So it's pretty much all the things I've been saying before. It's just the reverse of that. Um, so, you know, I think for me, uh, that opens me challenges. You know, some of the performance appraisal systems, focus too much on process. They don't focus on the person or the people. And because of that, they become impersonalized, inefficient, and ineffective as uh, employee development tools or indeed leadership tools. So I think that's what we should try and move away from, is focus on people, not the process. Make it informal but professional and ongoing and sustainable and integrate it with work. Don't have it as a separate discussion. It's, about, you know, it's every day, every week, every month. We're, we're here to perform, and it's that in, embedding that culture. So it's the reverse of all those things. And lack of, most fundamentally, lack of trust as well. So, you know, you're not going to get off first base if you're not able to build trust in the organization and within your team and teammates. Mm-hmm. And I know you were keen to, um, you have always have tons of examples, which I think are really helpful. You were keen to, to talk about that practice. So I guess we're, we're saying the same thing in different ways, but I think it's really important to nail that point. Bad practice versus good practice of performance management. Um, yeah. So earlier on, you started with a purpose. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about perhaps good practice first and bad practice? So not the consequences, but what is done when things are done right and what is done when things are just done wrong or could be done better? Mm. Well, I've been very fortunate on two or three occasions in my career being part of a high-performance team. So you know when that trust is there. You know when that ability to have conversations in a very open way where you can challenge and have conflict in a healthy, constructive way takes place. So, again, I mean, again, you know, using Lencioni's model of five dysfunctions of a team, you've got lack of trust, lack of conflict, lack of commitment, lack of lack of accountability, lack of results. That's probably the shorthand way I can answer that question. And that's because the things we've talked about in terms of good practice are, aren't taking place. Um, 
Sorry, can you mention the uh, reference you just gave again? You just gave out in chat the five. Yeah, there's five. Yeah, there's a piece of work by Patrick Lencioni. He's an American Italian and wrote, he's written a number of books. One was about the three faults the CEO always does. And the other book, um, probably better known, is Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And there's a pyramid with trust at the bottom of the pyramid, and then you work up the pyramid. And it's, it's some people, I'm working with a chap called David Clutterbuck at the moment, so I'm doing a lot of work in team coaching. So he, yeah. he, he thinks it's an oversimplified model. He may be right, but it's still quite a good model in terms of you know an initial thought, initial framework for uh, team team development. Um, if you get into team coaching, it's highly complex and another another level. But I think Patria Lencioni's basic framework is is a good one for discussion if you're looking for embedding trust and all the way through to delivering results. Amazing. Um, and so, how to deal? And we're we're going to wrap in a few. How do we deal with failure? So we've talked about what, how we deal with success by recognizing um, the great things people are doing. How we deal with failure to achieve or underperformance? I think the first thing you have to do with failure is recognize it. You know, there's many, if you haven't got the culture which says we've got to sweep it under the carpet, or failed, or I better not tell my boss, and I'm, you know, then that's not a good culture. The culture's wrong. So creating a culture where failure is recognized because failure happens when people try things um you can be incredibly successful doing nothing every day week in week out but where's the contribution so i think creating a culture where people are encouraged to innovate and try things differently and, and contribute by definition means that you're going to get the odd failure and i think the example i used earlier which i won't go over the details again but the failure was recognized i said okay so where's the learning points and then you set those learning points away, and then hopefully you don't fail. If something's consistently failing, that's an underlying problem, which even coaching can't resolve. You have to sometimes recognize it might be competence, commitment, motivation, personal circumstances, a whole range of things. But fundamentally, if you are having this culture where you're encouraging performance management and contribution towards performance, recognize it's going to get the odd failure. Accept it, recognize it, learn from it, move on. Uh, and that's you know that's good leadership as opposed to um, you know failing and saying well why have you failed and you've done a lousy job you know, so why have you failed what can we learn from it different approach. I guess that's uh, again a, a good conclusion. What can we learn from today's um, situation and from what we've had to 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 go through both from a performance perspective and from a leadership perspective of the very turbulent past few months? Well, I, I think we can, I can, I think there's two things we can learn. We can learn, hopefully, from good practice. And the fact we're in COVID-19, uh, what was good practice before COVID-19 is still sustainable, continues. That, that's, I think that's the case. So we still, you know, don't let's forget what is good practice and managing remotely. It's been around in the Middle East for many years. Uh, for many people. So that's not changed. So don't forget those fundamentals. However, the second thing I think is about this, you know, the phrase adapt or die, which is, you know, you have to adapt to the technology. Uh, I know I've had some learning curves to climb in terms of some of my clients and some group sessions I've been hold, holding. Um, so you have to, you have to say, well, you know, this is going to be here for a while. Where's the foreseeable future? I hate the phrase new normal, but I don't know what normal means, but I like the phrase new next. Next is definitely happening. Next is definitely coming. So, you know, embrace that. So embrace the technology and, and apply um, a, a positive mental attitude to that. So I think that's a key thing for us all to take forward for these very, very challenging times. So that mental, that positive mental attitude and an ability to adapt and learn and move on is a key thing. And, and through that, there'll be some failures. And sometimes the technology fails. And sometimes the cat walks in behind us or somebody else walks in on the technology and just say, that's okay, that's where we are. Let's accept it, let's move on. So I think in many ways, you know, what this has brought around is more of a, um, more of a, a clear understanding of some of the challenges people face in their working lives, uh, which maybe not have been uh, highlighted so much before. And I think it's given us more of a, a sense of collaboration and value of what 
what really matters in life, to be frank, without being too philosophical. I'm not a philosopher. Well, you're not a philosopher, neither are you a fortune teller, but Chris here is asking us, what do you think will be the new norm? Will we be working remotely forever? I'd love to hear uh, your take. Well, as I say, I don't like the word normal because it's normal for one person is completely different. Really nice. now, I think, I think um, um, without a crystal ball, but I think certainly this is here to stay for six to 12 months, managing and leading remotely, working remotely. Uh, the impact that that has on businesses has been evident in some of the work I've been doing recently, uh, where organizations are restructuring. Um, some organizations are enabling um, people to work remotely. I think it was um, I can't remember, a big organization in the States who just said that everybody can work remotely. I think an organization in China, whose name I can't forget, I can't remember, said a lot of people can work remotely. So it's going to impact that. So that's going to continue. Yeah, I'm not sure which one you're referring to, but I think the first one I made um, wave was not quite early for this whole thing with Twitter that said that its employees could work remotely forever. Um, and there are now a, uh, a number of companies, I think within the S500 or the kind of uh, tech uh, forward companies that are now talking about working from anywhere. So rebranding the work from home to working from anywhere, which is something that we are trailing the IPD. Um, so I, I'm sure there will be different uh, responses for different people. I know a lot of companies have had some uh, return to work policies and plans, but we are also seeing countries that are going back into lockdown. So that whole thing is, is, is here to stay, like you said, uh, Mark. Mm. Um, like I said at the beginning, at the CIPD, until we would be working from home until at least the end of 2020. Uh, which I think is a lot longer than many organizations are committed to, to doing. For us, the rationale was saying, where is, is it safest for you to work from home right now? Hence the decision. Um, but, uh, but surely we're seeing a change, and we're seeing a change in policies as well. A lot of things were not covered, and um, even from the labor law perspective, it was quite interesting. And um, Chris, I think it was asking the question, if you are interested in this, there are a number of groups that are CEO-led and very business-focused that are having these conversations, and I know recently in the region we're talking about um, the cost of doing business in the region, which has been really, really high, and so potentially this whole crisis is turning things on their head we really need as what do international companies really need to have a full-fledged office in the Middle East, for instance, we could operate from somewhere else? Um, so great questions, and we'll continue having them. Are there any more questions that we haven't asked? Or questions that you have for Martin on, on his experience or on performance management? All right, so we'll take one last one, I guess. Mohammed is asking us, usually in construction, in the construction industry, um, the people management focus is on productivity and pro profit, classic, and they don't believe uh, in HR practices up to some level, like performance management or engagement. In that case, what to do to motivate, ah, okay, how do we get management buy-in um, and, and uh, engage them to get involved with HR? Um, so I guess that's a big question. So management buying for the HR profession, I'm assuming, uh, lack of trust in the HR profession. So a whole webinar, um, but what would you say? <laughs> uh, I think um, it's a really good question. It's a very realistic question, very practical. Um, I think you have to uh, try and try and demonstrate wherever you are in the organization some of the benefits of, of managing, leading, working with people along the lines we've been talking around today. It's not going to happen overnight, um, but you... Uh, so what, is it Hamad? Hamad asked a question, did you say? Hamad? Um, Mohammed. Mohammed. Now, Mohammed reminded me of two things. One is that I started in the car industry at Land Rover, and I remember working with managers who were completely command and control. That led in ultimately to the virtual failure of Land Rover as a business by poor management and then eventually acquisition takeover from people who have much more forward thinking uh, leadership and management ideals, which now has demonstrated, you know, it all has resulted in a very successful organization, although no longer British owned, Indian owned organization. So I've witnessed that. And I think the second thing is when I was on a, a management training program many years ago, uh, somebody said, it doesn't matter where you are in the organization, wherever you sit, even if you're sitting down 
in an organization chart somewhere that you can impact on people. And I've always remembered that. He said, you know, think about what your legacy is. What messages do you want to communicate? How do you want to present yourself? So my encouragement to Mohammed is keep working at it. Don't expect fast results because you're pushing against the tide. But one day it will change, I believe. But it's uh, not going to change overnight. So really good question, Mohammed, because that's a very, very, very practical, challenging situation. But um, uh, keep going. Um, there's a phrase which is, says, um, uh, ca cowards, cowards die uh, many times, but the brave only die once. And it's um, Giovanni Falcone's quotation. So be brave, keep going, and keep, keep working what you believe in and good practice. Never give up. I could use a Churchill quote here and say, never, never give up. I have done so. I've used that as well. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Martin. Uh, this wraps up our session. I hope you all enjoyed the recording will be made available um, for you to watch or rewatch uh, within a week's time. In the meantime, I have popped a few links in the chat. So before you leave, if you're interested, make sure you uh, flag those or, or store those. I have just popped a link in case you would like to receive the CFD newsletter, which is every two weeks and features reports, upcoming webinars and resources. Um, and of course, we still have virtual courses now that will be taking place and you can know more on social media. All right. Thank you so much, Martin, for your uh, time today and for sharing all of this. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Yeah, thank you, everybody. I appreciate your attendance and uh, all the very best to everybody going forward. Thank you. Thank you.